Timothy chapter 3. We are a verse by verse, chapter by chapter kind of church, and so if you're new here, welcome, we're glad you're with us, and today is one of those topics that might be a little bit potentially boring for you, potentially, if this is your first time uh, being in church, but how many of you have actually grown up in the church? Raise your hand. Okay, all right, all right. How many, this is kind of new to you, kind of experiencing this for the first few weeks, first couple times? Okay. Well, when you hear the word overseer or elder, what comes to mind? Like, if you were raised in the church, maybe this wasn't your first church, maybe you've been in other churches. What is a function of an elder? You can raise your hand. I'll kind of point out. Yeah. Like a leader. A leader? Good. Nice. What else? Decision maker? Maybe we don't know, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, anybody else? A mentor? An overseer? One more. Someone with wisdom. Oh, that sounds good. Okay. Well, let's pray. Glorious Father, thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the fact that we get to stand here. We get to sit, kneel before your throne. We get to worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have through your word. And I pray, God, that what I'm about to share will actually breathe life into our hearts. May we be a church that functions through the lens of your scripture appropriately and help us to stay away from our own agenda, our own wills, our own ideals, and help us to stay on track with what your gospel teaches. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I know it's been a while since I've been up here. I appreciate our church. I appreciate the, the fact that we have many great communicators of God's word. There was a, a few weeks there that I had to go see a, a memorial down in Southern California of my mentor. So I missed that week. I got sick the following week. And so that was a bummer. And then the last three weeks have been already pre-planned by individuals in our church. They had a year calendar and they got to pick which topic they wanted to speak on. And so now I get an opportunity of hopefully not boring you through the act of elders in the church. And I want to thank Russ Adams for preaching last week and covering the latter half of chapter two. I also appreciate the fact that he was leaving the last three verses talking about the position of women in the church. What a sticky situation that would have been for Russ to navigate through those waters. And you're probably going, okay, James, tell us. What is we as women in the church, what is our role? What can we do? Well, if you heard Russ share, we are spending the next year, this entire year, searching the scriptures, trying to define and understand God's word when it comes to women in ministry and how that looks. And hopefully you heard the fact that he was saying that we were going to take that year to do that. And the reason why we're taking a year is because we want to go through each passage that talks about women, their role, and their leadership, each perspective, and allow the scripture, the way it was written, the culture from where it was written, the context from which it was written, the language from which it was written, to lead us and direct us. We don't want to just have a stance and not have anything backing it up. We also want to stay away from our, our own and others' opinions or the way that we were raised. Most of us were probably raised differently, but we were also raised with opinions. Um, how many have ever heard the word, because I said so? Okay, or that's how it's always been? Yeah, we want to stay away from that. We also want to stay away from cherry pickers. What I mean by that is people that have a stance on women in ministry or uh, men in leadership and things like that, and they go, well, this is the one verse that I got. Okay, great. And so they think they have the trump card verse, and they slap it down, and then the discussion's over, but we want to stay away from that as well. The other reason why we want to do this is because it is fairly common for churches to dodge larger topics. They want to dodge it. It's easier to just go, hey, we're not really going to talk about that because we don't want to rustle feathers and offend and hurt people. Well, look it. Scripture offends. Hate to say it. Scripture will offend you because it's calling you out. Scripture calls us all out in our sin, in our humanness. And so if it doesn't offend you, you're probably reading it incorrectly. If you read it and you go, wow, what a great book, and there's nothing I need to learn from it, you're missing the point. So let me lay some groundwork for a few moments before we tackle the next chapter 
um, that we're going to read this morning. First, we are a complementarian church. What I mean by that is it means that we believe that God created men and women uniquely to complement each other, both in marriage and also in ministry. Second, we realize that complementation churches come with a wide variety of ranges of conclusions regarding several important aspects of what that actually looks like in ministry. Third, we want to be able to give a strong biblical response for whatever practices that we put in place here as a church. Therefore, the elders have devoted this year to thoroughly pray through, study the topic, including first a uh, portion of each monthly elder meeting, we are going to unpack what we've studied together and pray over it and read through it, okay? So what I would ask is that you as a church, if whether you're an attender of the church or you're a member of the church here, uh, just pray for us because we want to make sure we do this appropriately, okay? So that, that's what I would like to ask of our church. Can you join us in that? Okay, so if you're still wanting to know, well, where do I get to serve if I'm a lady in the church? Pause. There is room for you here, okay? But I'm not going to tell you what that is right now. Okay, fair enough? Here we go. Let's go to the verse. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. It says this, The saying is trustworthy. Well, isn't that fun? It, it's hard to trust in our, in our current day and age, right? And Paul just drops it. He goes, The saying is trustworthy. So I guess we got to trust what he says here, right? Let's keep reading. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, bishop, elder, shepherd, pastor, whatever word you want to implant there, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Great point, Paul. Great point. He keeps going. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil, Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. So people outside the church need to speak well of this individual so that he may not fall into disgrace into the snare of the devil. All right. Who wants to be an elder? Anybody? Who wants to be a bishop, an overseer, a pastor, a shepherd? Especially with this. Great. That's awesome. With this, with this kind of job description, I don't know. It's not like I woke up one morning and like, man, I can't wait to be an elder or a pastor in the church. In fact, I wanted to go the opposite direction. I was not looking at this going, wow, I think I can attain that. I think I can meet that. I think I'm qualified for that. I wanted nothing to do with it. And then it happens. It's kind of one of those things. It's very interesting. Now, I'll tell you this. American churches struggle with this passage. And I know that's not a popular thing to say because we're in America and we are in the church in America. So obviously we are doing it right. Well, if you've at all ever traveled to other countries and seen other churches and taken passages like this and let it speak for itself, you would notice that there are probably other churches and leaders out there across the world that are doing it in a healthy way, biblically. Unfortunately, we usually pick, in the North American church for elders, we pick the sharpest minds that come from the business world. That's what we tend to do. Because we are an economic, booming society. And so if it works out in the world, it's easily translated into the church. It's got to be, right? They got the secret sauce, and so now they're bringing it into the church. The reasons they do this is because sizes of churches and their budgets. The question becomes, how can we grow the church numerically and financially? That becomes the driving force for a lot of American churches. Is that at all what we just read? 
Am I missing something? Absolutely not. But this is how we view leadership in the church sometimes. How can we build bigger buildings to help us grow the masses? How can we staff for that kind of growth? But here's the problem. It's a huge problem. We took our eyes and focus off of God's word and his desire to spread the gospel. And we've become self-centered, self-focused, and man-made. However, true biblical elders are not the sharpest business minds. And if that's what you're hoping for in your elders, although we have very smart elders, you're going to be let down. Biblical elders are called to guide and guard the flock. If we could take all of these qualifications and ones that we've read in other passages of Scripture and whittle it down to two things, what an elder actually does is they guide and guard the flock. What I mean by that is they guide and guard the church. They guide us towards God's gospel and purpose for his church, and they guard the flock from false teaching and lame, I will say lame, tangents. That's the goal of an elder. Now, I've been in five churches and five different eldership boards. I've been in leadership in two different denominations, usually a little bit higher up. And I've witnessed firsthand how things get done in not only those five churches, but also other churches. And as somebody who is considered an elder, I'm saddened by it. I'm saddened by it. Because most people that come to church, you're thinking, well, it looks good, so obviously things are getting done appropriately. It's unfortunate because the higher up you go in leadership, sometimes you begin to start seeing some of the flaws. And there's politics in the church. There's business aspects of a church. But when we take our eyes off of what God has called us to do as his church, it becomes very, very toxic. And you probably see this with pastors and elders that are losing their leadership or they're taking money or they're having extramarital affairs. You've probably heard about this stuff. Like, I don't need to start naming names, right? But you, you, you read about the, the Christian realm in North America and you go, I used to follow that guy. I listen to their messages. I read their books, and this is what they're doing? What's going on? There's a pattern that's happened in North America, and I will say Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to look out for that kind of thing. And if I could whittle it down to one thing, it's humanity. It's humanity. I don't think anybody that has ever taken money or had an extramarital affair or that has taken the gospel and whittled it down to a business construct, I don't think they started that way. I don't think they woke up one morning and was like, how can I launder money through the church? I don't think they did that. I think as they continued to stay away from the intent of the gospel, the more they swayed. And then the more the pollution of sin and Satan's wrath comes upon them, and the more arrogance and pride begins to start building, I think that's when it goes out sideways. We want the biblical definition and job description of elders to help our church stay away from man-made constructs and Satan's evil grip. All right, so number one on your notes which you don't have points, right? It's a blank page. I just remembered that. The reason why is because I didn't turn in any notes. But I do have points, so if you want to write it down, you can. Point number one is this, spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership. Now, we all have our opinion on what that might look like, maybe what you think a good spiritual leadership would look like. But let's unpack this. Verse 1 He says, this is a faithful saying. This saying is trustworthy. This is God's definition. If we could do it this way, we're going to be a healthy church. That's what he's saying. 
He says, if a man desires the position of elder, or in maybe some of your translations, bishop, he desires a good work. It's a good task. It's noble. Right? It is noble. Because you don't get kudos for it. You're dealing with all the drama that happens when you've got sheep that do whatever they want. I mean, it's not popular. It's not fun. I'll tell you right now. Church discipline is not fun. Having to bring people back to the intention of the gospel and scriptures sometimes is not fun. When you have to get into the weeds of people's lives, you see and hear a lot of things. It's, it's painful. It's not like an elder gets up and goes, man, I can't wait to sit down and let people spiritually and, and verbally vomit all over me. Like, it's not enjoyable. But there's a noble task that comes from it because we as elders have to be okay with that kind of emotional drama. Because if we're not okay with it, where do they go? Where do we go if we have no one to talk to? Vices? TV? Self-help books? We're getting all kinds of polluted def definitions and help rather than good biblical help, right? So, he says it's a noble task, but not no man is qualified to be a spiritual leader in the church just because of their gender. Just because you're a man in here does not mean you're qualified, right? So, that's his point. The office Paul describes to is that bishop, that leader, that shepherd, that elder, and our religious culture has given us a particular idea of what a bishop might look like. And for some of you in here, you've probably, maybe at one point or another, have had bad taste in your mouth. Let's be so bold as to see. How many of you have ever left a church because of the leadership in the church? Ooh, look around. Hold, keep them up. Look around. Look around. That's way more than half. That's a problem. That's a problem, right? So he's saying this is very, very important role. In fact, here's a quote by uh, Clark. He's a theologian. He says, These were men with leadership and authority in the church. The state has its monarch. The church has its bishop. One should govern according to the laws of the land. The other according to the word of God. Not get them confused. We do not govern the church based off the laws of the land. We base the rules and the leadership of the church based off the Word of God. And unfortunately, I shared a whole bunch of drama before. A lot of leaders in the church are basing decisions off the laws of the land. No wonder why we have problems. How well is our laws of our land doing? Right? Like we all have our own opinions there too. And I don't want to go down that rabbit trail. But when you bring all that into the church and we go, well, it's obviously working somewhat there, so let's bring it into here, right? And I know I keep going back to 2020 because it was an absolute train wreck of a year. But I don't follow the laws of the land. I follow the Word of God, right? And so when we had to see what we we're supposed to do as God's people moving forward, even in the midst of a virus, Yes, do we want to be considerate and care? Absolutely. But we have to look at the Word of God in order to make godly decisions rather than earthly, worldly decisions. In Acts chapter 20, verse 17, we also learn there were several bishops, that is, overseers, in one church in one city. Now, what would that look like at Puyallup if all the elders in every church got together and we were the spiritual leaders of all of Puyallup? Oh, corruption. Yes. Right? Because we got a lot of opinions. Right? So it can become dangerous. But, man, back in the day, in Acts chapter 20, that's how, they, that's how it worked. And Paul continued to write letters to the leaders in the church going, Hey, guys, I love you. You're my brothers in Christ. But you keep making bad decisions. Let's bring you back to the gospel. Let's bring you back to the point. Now, where are these letters in America? Who's writing American leaders letters saying, guys, you've taken your eyes off the goal? 
It's the Bible. It's the Bible. I don't need to go write a letter to thousands of American churches. All I got to do is say, hey, let's, what does it say? What's it say? It's already written. The letter is here. Undoubtedly, these were men who had oversight over many house churches that met throughout the city, and then they gathered together for prayer, fasting, and discussion about the gospel and how to spread it. And I guarantee you this, they weren't sitting down as leaders in Acts going, hey, what new program does Ephesus have that we can snatch and use it in our home churches to help speed up the growth process. They didn't do that. They didn't go, hey, well, I was at this home church the other day and I saw a smoke machine and the guy was coming out with a little ukulele and then the smoke like came out behind him and people were like, whoa, man, we need to go and invest in smoke machines. Great idea. Because people will go, wow, that's a really cool trendy church that has smoke machines. They didn't do any of that. What did they do? They broke bread together. They ate together, they remembered the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and they got back to what Christ told them to do. He said, make disciples. Preach his word to all nations. Every woman, man, and child. Right? That's how easy it is. That's the letter that, that Jesus gave us. That's the disciples call to bring back uh, to bring us back to and yet we look at that and we go there's got to be more than that in order to grow a church all right so let's go to number two you can write this one down number two what are the qualifications well he just gave us a huge list of them so that's what we're going to go through and then i'll let you go now, some of you have been really enjoying the 20 and 30 minute messages and getting out of here real quick. And you're like, man, I'm glad Pastor James ain't here. But James is back and he's got some, some points to share. God has specific qualifications for leaders in the church. Leaders are not to be chosen at random, they're not to be chosen at random, nor just because they volunteer, nor because they aspire to the position, nor even because they are natural-born leaders, nor because they're extroverted, nor if they built bigger and better businesses. Instead, they should be chosen primarily on how they match the qualifications listed here. The qualifications for leaders have nothing to do with giftedness. Right? So we in the church, we probably go, wow, they got six spiritual gifts. I only have two. Therefore, they probably should be a leader. No. So giftedness had nothing to do with it. God doesn't say, go out and get the most gifted men and make them fishers of men. Because if he did that, Jesus did not go after the most gifted individuals. Right? They were knuckleheads. And they really didn't know what they were doing. And those are the ones Jesus picked. It's kind of interesting how that works out. But in North America, we want to hire the best of the best. The brilliant minds. The ones that are the highly most educated individuals. The ones that are the gifted and the talented. And that's how we hire them. Because they're going to help us build better industry. Jesus goes the other direction. And goes, I want the humble. I want the meek. I want the patient. I want the peaceful. Well, that doesn't sound like hiring material in North America, right? We don't, we don't vote for our leaders in government because they're meek and peaceful and sensitive. I'll say another thing. Going to seminary doesn't make you qualified for spiritual leadership either. Because if that were the case, we would have far more elders out there. But that's not it, because remember, they didn't have seminaries back then either. Right? Jesus went after, actually, a few uneducated. B. 
Being a good talker doesn't make one qualified for spiritual leadership. Natural and spiritual gifts in themselves do not qualify them for spiritual leadership. What one gives in money or volunteer time does not qualify them for spiritual leadership. What qualifies a man for spiritual leadership? You ready for this? It's two words. It's two words. You can write it down. Godly. It's a good place to start. Godly. The next word would be character. Godly character. However, this is not a rigid list which demands perfection. So when you read this, I don't want you to go, man, you got to be perfect. Got to be perfect. Nope. However, it is goals to reach with the general criteria that Paul lays out for Timothy. So, when looking for church leaders, one should look at a list like this and ask several questions. Does that individual in question desire all these things with his whole heart? Second question was, does that desire show itself out in their life? And then third, I would say, are there others available who better fulfill the requirements on this list? I'll tell you right now, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I'll just give you a little, a little story, and then I'll continue, and I'll actually land the plane here. All right. So I was in a mega church many, many years ago, and the lead pastor didn't have an elder board. It was a pastor-led church. And the qualifications for what he hired for pastors were businessmen, successful businessmen. We had a pastor of, of, of finance. We had a pastor of the building. We had a pastor of building and grounds. We had a pastor of landscaping. I didn't even know you needed one. But we did. And every single one of them didn't have any educational background in theology, no Bible training at all. In fact, when I said to... Uh, the pastor, the lead guy, that I was going to go back to school and get my, my degree in theology. He told me no. And I pushed back and I said, well, why? And he goes, I don't want my pastors knowing more about the Bible than me. And I said, well, that's a problem. That's a big problem. I don't know if that sends, like, red flags to anyone else. But sure did to me when I was 29. I think I was 29 at the time. I'm like, ah, that just sounds terrible. Like, that just sounds wrong. Unfortunately, this is what tends to happen. Now, that was my experience, but I've also seen it play out in a lot of different churches. But these qualifications of godly character, here it is. Blameless. Now, that sounds incredibly big. Blameless? Like, not even one, one area of question? What does the word blameless mean? This word literally means nothing to take hold upon. That they're not, they're not allowing things and vices to, to hold on to, to allow to attack the church. This is a broad term for a man who lives a righteous life that can be seen as righteous, right? No one can stand up and rightfully accuse that man of grievous sin. It's basically a track record of behavior. doesn't mean that that individual will never sin, because that's virtually impossible, this side of heaven. But what it does mean is there's a track record of behavior. Do you understand what I mean by a track record of behavior? Like, if you're a parent in here, you understand. Your children. There's a track record of behavior. Well, we also as adults have track records of behavior too. And so elders, what Paul is telling Timothy is that we need to raise leaders in the church that have a track record. That you can look at their life and go, you know what? They might not be perfect, but they are working to be blameless. They're in process, right? Next one is a husband of one wife. The idea here is a one-woman man is what Paul is getting at. It is not that a leader must be married in order to be an elder, because if that were true, Jesus and Paul, how could they, right? Nor is the idea that the leader could never remarry if his wife passed away or if they got biblically divorced. 
Now that's a fun one to start going after, right? The idea is that his love and affection and heart is given to one woman and one woman only, and that is his wife. That means he's not checking other things out, right? That one's pretty self-explanatory, I would think. All right, temperance. Temperance is another good one. The idea is that someone who is not given into extremes. So it kind of goes back to blameless. I mean, there is a track record of behavior there. They are reliable and trustworthy, and you don't have to worry about wide swings of vision or mood swings or action, right? That there, there is a, a temperate personality and heart behind them. They're, they're not extreme in their attitudes. They're not extreme with their opinions. They're not extreme in their relationships. Then he goes on and says sober-minded. This describes the person who is able to think clearly with clarity. They are not constantly joking, but know how to deal with serious subjects in a serious way. Now, look, I, I like to joke around and, and try to be funny, old man funny, dad funny, like bad dad joke funny. But there are times where I can actually turn off that part of my personality and actually have a decent conversation, right? Now, there are times that my, my jokes and my sarcasm might hurt and offend. Well, then I have to go back to, you know, repenting for being a tool and making sure that I actually get back to what God has instructed us as elders to be. Does that make sense? Okay. Then he goes on and talks about good behavior. The idea here with good behavior is orderly. They're orderly. You can read about that First 1 Timothy 2.9. We learned about that not too long ago. And the same word is translated as modest. They're modest. Orderly, perhaps dignified in the best sense of the term. They are modest in their approach. Okay? Hospitable. You can't be an elder and not be hospitable. Which means if you don't like people, you probably shouldn't be an elder. I mean, does that make sense? It's not talking about introvert versus extrovert, and I think a lot of people get that mixed up. Like, we only want extroverted elders versus introverted ones. That has nothing to do with it. It's more, are you hospitable? Are you willing and able to open up your home to both friends and strangers? Are you willing to give up your time to go hang out with people? That's what hosp hospitality means, being hospitable. Then he goes on, able to teach. This one is an interesting one because a lot of people read that and they go, oh, that means they get to stand up on stage and, and preach to a bunch of different varieties of people. That's not what it's saying, right? He means here is they are skilled enough in the Bible. They know enough of the Bible to teach, either publicly or in a one-on-one -on -one setting. So as an elder, you might not, well, I mean, we have one elder currently that's like, there's no way I want to stand up on front of the stage. I mean, and I've tried. I have tried to get them up here, and they don't want to. And they think, I don't think they, they might be an elder because they, they're not up here. No, 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 no. Don't get that twisted. Could that individual sit down one-on-one -on -one with somebody and explain the gospel of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. That's what it means to be able to teach. Okay? All right, let's keep going. Not giving in to wine. <laughs> okay. All right. So this one's great, too, because um, the denomination I grew up in is Assembly of God. It's a Pentecostal denomination. And in the Assembly of God, each pastor signs a document saying that they'll never touch alcohol, that it's a sin and, and it's going to be a problem for them the rest of their life. And then what happens, they have a lot of pastors that end up touching alcohol. Because they were told no. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. And then they have addiction problems. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying don't touch alcohol. It's saying don't touch too much alcohol where you're no longer sober-minded. Right? Because what happens if you drink excessively, your boundaries, your personality, your thoughts, your convictions can easily change. And I don't have to go back into naming people in North American church that have fallen too much into that trap. Now, 
Does he discourage alcohol? Sure. But is he saying that if you do drink that you shouldn't and that you shouldn't be an elder? And this is where people in the church get mad. Oh, I saw that person have a beer. They're done. I can't respect that person. That's not what that says. So when we take that passage and we go, well, Paul said, don't be a drunkard of wine. Okay, was, was he drunk? Did he have a beer? Now, I don't like beer, but did he have a beer? Yes, he had a beer. Okay, was it three beers? Two beers? Are we in the weeds now? I'll keep moving. Not violent. Well, that's funny because alcohol actually could lead to violence. So he parallels that. It goes right after it. Not violent. This is a man who is not given into violence either publicly nor in his private life. Now, what I mean by church face, I'm sure most of you know what that means. We come to church on a Sunday. I don't care what time you come. Maybe you go to a Bible study. Maybe you go to a life group. Maybe you go to a women's ministry event. Maybe you go to a men's ministry event. And you come in and you're like, praise Jesus. What's God doing in your life today? Thank you, Lord. And you bring your biggest Bible and you give out the persona that you are on some level, right? But then if we got into your family life, if there was a camera crew watching your life outside of your church life, would it be the same or would it be different? It's like, I, I don't get angry at anybody. I'm pretty peaceful when it comes to people. And then you go home and yell at your wife, probably a problem. Probably an issue. Do your kids speak highly of you? Or would they say, my dad yells at me all the time. When I don't do what he says in that moment, he yells at me immediately. Okay, now we have a problem maybe with violence and with anger. That would be a disqualification. Next one, not greedy over money. This is huge. Money does not drive decisions. I'll tell you right now, if you go to a church and all you hear them say on a Sunday is money, 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 or they take every passage of Scripture and somehow bring it back to money, you now know what drives their decision making. How many people have ever been in a church where maybe money has been the driving force of that organization? Okay, so you know what I'm saying. Same church that I told you about. I remember being in a staff meeting. He goes, hey, I just want to get down to the nitty gritty. Put down your pants. Don't write this down. It's about nickels and noses. I'm like, oh, my God. How did I enter into this church? The faster we get them out, the faster the parking space is open for the next person to come in. I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is where we're at. It's dangerous, not being greedy over money. Gentle is the next one. The kind of man who takes Jesus as his example. Jesus was very gentle. Now, did Jesus turn over tables? Absolutely, but why did he turn over tables? Was it because he, he had an anger problem and he just snapped one day? He's like, I'm tired of people. Table, table. No. Why did he throw the table? Because they were using to make money. Right? The sacrifices up in the price of lambs for sacrifices. That's what they were doing. And Jesus was ticked. It's not about that. Right? So somebody who was gentle, Jesus would kneel down for a child. He wasn't like, I'm the bee's knees. I'm great at speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody's coming to hear me. He's very gentle in his approach. And that's what good elders look like. Not quarrelsome. Goes back to not being violent. The kind of person who is not always fighting over something or others. Not covetous. This is more uh, encompassing thought than merely just a greedy person or money. It's the covetous man is never satisfied with anything, always demanding something more and different. And this is where churches tend to go, okay, uh, we are a church of 400. We need to be 500 by next year. 
And if we don't get there, then it's probably because of this staff person. It's probably because of this bad uh, worship team. It's probably because of this. And so we need to get rid of them and need to get rid of them, hire this, and then get this. And then all of a sudden we'll be at 500 next year. And then the next year after that, we need 600. That's a covetous leader. You don't want that. A man who's constantly dissatisfied is not fit for leadership among God's people. Rules his own household well. Now, how do we, how do we view that here? Um, let me ask some questions. Okay, as, as the church, as members of the church, how do you know? How do you really know if your elder that you vote for, by the way, we're an elder voting church here, congregation approves and, and votes for those elders, how do you know how they are at their home? Help me out. How do you know? Is it just because I said, I'm good with my family? Nobody wants to play? Holy Spirit tells you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Unpack that. Sorry to put you on the spot. Sorry, I'll, I'll take that back. I don't want you to be like where you can't speak. Okay. Knowing them, who would agree? Knowing them outside the church. Okay, so if you ever go to a church, and if this is our, the church you're at and you're a little bit questionable on our leadership, if you ever go to a church and you go up to the pastor or you go up to another elder and you go, hey, I'd just love to get to know you, and they go, well, I really don't have time for that. What, what would that tell you? Would that be a flag? Maybe, right? Nearest exit, maybe. Maybe. But how do, you, how do you have relationship with pastors and elder, elders in larger churches? Now, like home churches, you know everybody. There's 20 of you, right? So you're, you're working with them in their home. You see how they act. But in churches of 400, 500, now you're at a place where it's like, like, for instance, I'll be honest, I can't be in every one of your homes. So how do you know? Like, how do you really know? Or, or a church of 1,000 or, or 2,000. The Holy Spirit leads you, having relationship, absolutely. How about like rubbing shoulders with their families? Have you ever walked by someone and you're like, man, something's going on, I can sense it. Like you're, all the hairs in the back of your neck stand up, like you could tell something's going on. Maybe that, that determines it, I don't know. Like I, I know for myself, I'm an open book. You could ask my kids anything. You can ask my wife anything. And I guarantee you, my boys will be, well, yeah, my dad's disciplined me out of anger a few times in my life. I hope they tell you that because it's true. Was I right? Absolutely not. But hopefully, yeah, my dad was pretty cool. If not, my dad's this and I hate my dad and da-da-da-da-da. Now you got a problem with your pastor, right? Now, I do understand that kids say the darndest things, I learned that in the 80s, but, but if there's a pattern, do you see, coming back to the pattern thing. Okay, let me keep going. Uh, not a new convert. Why does he say that? He goes, uh, uh, let's get back to that verse. He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. I'll just give my own personal story. When I rededicated my life at 18 in Bible college, man, I was passionate. I was passionate. And, and I really did believe God tell me I, I'm going to be a youth pastor one day. And I wanted it like right away. And I came out of, of Bible college and I got hired right away. And I could not wait to thump people over the head with the Bible. I'm like, I know the truth. I know the truth, and I can't wait to show you the truth. Hey, you're living with your girlfriend. Sin. You're doing this. Sin. You're doing that. Sin. What happened? Good thing I wasn't a pastor or an elder at that moment. Somebody said to me, James, you need a little more time. You're still cooking in the oven, right? You still need to bake a bit longer, and then you'll be ready. But why was it? Because arrogance comes in. Arrogance comes in, right? We think we know it all, and we can't wait to tell people how much we know. That's a problem. That's why Paul's telling Timothy, 
You don't want a recent convert, although amazing they're, they, they received Jesus. Let them be discipled a little longer before they have to take exit foot from mouth, right? Finally, this is last it, last, last point here, a good testimony, a good testimony. These characteristics must be evident to all, even unbelievers to see. The potential leader must be a good Christian uh, inside the walls and outside the walls. So what does this mean? So most elders aren't paid. They're not paid. That means they're tent makers. What that means is they have jobs. So if the church speaks well of them here, if we were to go to their job and talk to their coworkers or their employees or their employer, would they say the same thing? Yeah, what you see in Mike is the same thing that I see. What you said about Jason is the exact same thing I see with Jason. Or even my role now. If, if you went to the academy, it would be interesting. I got a guy here from academy. You can ask him, is James similar or is he a little weird? He'd probably say he's a little weird. But I hope, I hope that I'm at least the same. Like, I love equally. I respect people equally. Like, I want to see people encouraged equally. And if not, then I need to make a change. Or we as a church need to make a change. Does that make sense? All right, let me close with this. Let me finish with CCBC. That's our church here, Christ Community Baptist Church. My desire has been, always has been, and you can ask those who are on the elder board if this is true or not, to get away from business meetings. For three years, and, and this is really easy for elders to get trapped in business, to get away from it. To get away from it. And I'll talk more about that next week when we get to deacons. But to get away from business. What I mean by business is the building, financials, organizational constructs and conversations. We need to, we need to offload that off of the elder board. And the reason why I say that is because we're taking our eyes off the point. We're taking our eyes off the gospel when all we do is talk about money or talk about how to repair things in the building or, or how to fix, fix our signage because it had Christmas Eve services on it for a month and a half. You, you follow me? Most of you probably drove by and saw it because I got many texts. Um, trying to get away from all that and get back to the focus of the gospel. Why are we here? Why are we here? It's not for this building. We are not here for painted lines in our parking lot. We're not here for signage. We're not here for that. We are here to spread the gospel. That's what we're called to do. And we as elders are called to help bring discipleship, prayer, fasting, Doctrinal statements so that we are pointed in the right direction of the conversation that we have through Christ's example in this church. And I'll speak more about that next week. But all I'll say is this. Although we are wanting the biblical definition of, of what elders look like here at our church, we are still human. And we still make mistakes. And we are not perfect. And so what I would ask is that you pray for the elders of your church. Pray that God will continue to call them out where they need to be called out, to challenge them where they need to be challenged, but most of all, that they get back to the point of the gospel on guiding and guarding this flock and those that God has entrusted to us. Could we do that? All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you bring challenges like this to help expose issues in, in your church. God, you know we're human, but you also know the heart. You know the human heart better than anything, better than anyone. So God, I pray that not only we at CCBC will be this way, but all the churches will function biblically the way you've called us to as leaders. God, I pray that we will be good stewards of what you've entrusted to us, and may we oversee the protection and the, and the guidance of your word 
And may we speak well. And may others speak well of us. In Jesus' name, amen.